from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning with verse 5. I hope you've brought your Bibles because we want to talk about a very important subject today. The judgment of God, the love of God, and the coming again of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. Not the end of the world. There's not going to be an end to the world. But there is going to be an end to the age in which we live that's dominated by the devil and dominated by evil. That will come to an end. And Christ the Messiah is going to come back. We want to talk about that a little bit today. The second chapter of 2 Peter. Now, 2 Peter in your Bibles comes right after 1 Peter, if you're having trouble finding it. Beginning with verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those who would live ungodly in the future. And deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and trials. If you're going through a serious temptation now or trial now, God knows how to deliver you. If you'll turn to him and pray by faith and believe and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Those that are outside of Christ, those that live wicked lives are being reserved until the day of judgment. There is a judgment day coming. The biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah comes down to us today as an example of what could happen even in this decade or in the decades ahead if we don't turn to God. Now Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities and they were at the place that now the Dead Sea is in the Middle East. The Dead Sea is 10 miles by 50 mile inland lake in the Lord Jordan Valley. It's a mineral saturated body of water which is 1260 feet below sea level. It's the lowest part of the world. In Genesis 13, we read about Abraham. And Abraham is going through that part of the world with all of his flocks and all of his family, going to the land that God had promised him. He was a man of God. And he had his nephew with him by the name of Lot. And he saw that the servants of Lot and his servants were not getting along too well. So he said to Lot, Lot, let's divide. We've gotten too big. There are too many of us. Too many cattle. Your cattle and my cattle are getting mixed up. You choose wherever you want to live. If you want to go west toward what is now Palestine, or if you want to go across the Jordan and go to the Jordan Valley, which is lush like a Garden of Eden, you take a choice and I'll take the other way. So Lot looked all around and he looked down toward Sodom. He looked down toward Gomorrah and he saw that that was a very wealthy part of the world, a very wonderful part to live in. He consulted his wife. She said, by all means, we want to go to Sodom. She wanted to go where the good times were. And so Lot told Abraham, all right, Uncle Abraham, we're going to go, we've chosen to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and go down to the lush valley of the Jordan. And we'll take our cattle and our servants and our people and our family and that's where we'll go. Abraham agreed, said, all right. 
the Dead Sea was surrounded in that time. It was no Dead Sea, of course, but at that time it was a lush, unbelievably lush part of the world. But with their wealth came a lifestyle of hedonism, sexual obsession, and perversion, the like of which has hardly ever been equaled in the history of the world. So that today the word Sodom is used to describe a certain lifestyle that people may adopt. As God has sent a flood to destroy a corrupted humanity in Noah's day, so upon Sodom and Gomorrah he sent a totally destroying judgment of fire. And that fire of brimstone that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah not only destroyed it, but sank that part of the world to the lowest part of the earth. Now what were the sins of Sodom? Why did God allow that judgment to fall? The first sin that they had was false security. They were secure. And we today have a security behind our oceans and behind our military power. President Yeltsin has stated that the whole world could be standing unknowingly on the edge of an abyss. And you saw in your papers this morning the problems they're having in Russia right now, in the government. We have a false security. Woe to them that go down to Egypt. Now, Egypt in that day did not have much to do with Israeli people. And yet, time after time, the Israelis would go down to Egypt for help. And he said, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots. But they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now, the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. Isaiah the prophet is speaking in the 31st chapter. When he says that, they had false security. They thought they were absolutely secure. Nobody could ever take Sodom and Gomorrah. Then their second sin that the scripture mentions is pleasure. They lived for pleasure. In Job 20, the fifth chapter, it says, The joy making of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but a moment. You only have a moment to enjoy it. Then you have eternity to regret it. The scripture says there are pleasures in sin for a moment. Then it's all over. And then there's nothing but the remorse and the guilt. The scripture says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the scripture says, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of mirth is heaviness. Even when you're laughing, many people. In Psalm 53, 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But if you go back to the original language in Hebrew, here's what it says. The fool has said in his heart, no to God. He's not saying there's no God. He's just saying no to God. You see, you can't prove scientifically that there is a God, and you can't prove scientifically there's no God. But everybody knows there must be a God. And then there's another sin that Sodom and Gomorrah committed. It was overindulgence. The majority of the world, a great part of the world, lives under what we call the poverty level. And in Luke 21 it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day comes upon you unaware. John Eastwood wrote some time ago, People do not decide to be drunkards or drunk addicts or prostitutes or murderers of, or thieves, but they pitch their tent towards Sodom and the powers of evil overcome them. And how many of us are like that? We pitch our tent towards Sodom. We sort of live half in Sodom and half with Abraham. We sort of enjoy Sodom. We long for the things that Sodom has. We'd like to have the fun and the pleasure we imagine that they're having. We'd like to have all that money. 
but the powers of evil will overcome you and you will die before your time and be lost from God. In Jude the 12th verse it says, there are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. How many times we see charitable events and we thank God for those that are sincerely interested, but they go to have a big time and to be seen. And there's a spot in their charity. And that's the spot. And then the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had some new strange gods. Whenever a man seeks or honors or exalts anything more than God, that's idolatry. And there are many of us that are guilty of idolatry, but we don't realize it. In Psalm 44, it says, If we've forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hand to a strange God, shall not God search this out? Romans 1, it says, We've changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. We worship our bodies and we worship our good times and we spend more on our cosmetics than we do worshiping God and Christ. That's modern humanism. And then they were also guilty of greed. Greed was a plague on the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the addictions that today has thousands of Americans in its vice is gambling. And part of the gambling motivation is greed. Workers throughout the industrialized world are becoming increasingly traumatized by overwork and their effort to earn more than their needs require. So we neglect our families to get more money so that we can, and we don't really need it. God has promised to supply all of our needs, but he's never promised to supply all of our greeds. And then, in the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, so bad that God gave them up. In Romans 1 it says that God just gave them up three times. He said he gave them up. Has God given you up? No, the very fact you're here today shows that God has not given you up. God is still speaking to you. There's still a chance for you to come to Christ. There's still an opportunity for you to receive the love of God and the gift of God in Christ. In 2 Timothy 3 it says, Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy. And anyone who believes in high morality today is laughed at. Jeremiah said that they had forgotten how to blush. And there's a lot of truth in that. Now God warned Sodom. He sent some angels to Abraham to tell Abraham what he was going to do. He was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And Abraham said, wait a minute, Lord. If I would find some real believers in Sodom, if I found 50 righteous men, would you spare it? And God said, yes. He couldn't find 50. So he said to the Lord, all right, Lord, what about if I found 40? Then after a while he said, 30, then 20. Finally he said, if I find 10, Lord, would you spare them? And God said, yes, if you find 10 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare Sodom. But he couldn't find them. And that is a lesson to us, the importance of a dedicated minority. A minority of people who believe and who live it. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, says Isaiah 1, 9. To you Christians, Jesus gave a warning. He said, remember Lot's wife? The angels told you not to look back. If you did look back, 
you'd be turned to a pillow of salt. Well, she did look back. And she was turned to a pillow of salt. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. That's an example for us today. Remember Lot's wife, one of the shortest verses in all the Bible. Don't look back. Many of us look longingly at the world, and many are like Demas, having forsaken Christ because of the love of this present world. Now, the climax of history is going to be judgment. The Bible warns that the world is in for a gigantic judgment. The only bright spot is the promised return of Jesus Christ, because the Scripture teaches from one end to the other that Christ is going to come back someday. He's going to set up his kingdom, and evil and the devil are going to be eliminated, and this is going to be heaven on earth when Jesus comes back. You see, Jesus Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross and died for us. He took all the hell and the, all the judgment on him at the cross. And the scripture says, God so loved the world, God so loved this present world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that includes you, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, well, when is Christ going to come back? Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We don't know the day. Don't, don't speculate. It's coming. It's sure. He left us certain signs. I wish we had time to go into all of them today. I believe that every one of those signs is being fulfilled right now. And Christ could come back at any time. For How will Christ come? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a glorious time that's going to be when Christ returns. The voice of the archangel. I'm looking forward to hearing that voice. I've never heard an archangel. And the trump of God. What trump that'll, trumpets that'll be? Now it'll also be a time of personal judgment when you... If you've really never received Christ, now you may be baptized and you may be confirmed and you may be a church member and all of that. That's wonderful. I'm thankful. But that's not enough. Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, all your religion is not enough. You must be born again. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you open your heart and surrender to him as Lord and Master and Savior, at that moment, your name is written in the book of life. And if my name were not written in that book of life, you'd never get me out of this stadium until I'd made sure it's been written there. Because only those who are written in the book of life are going to enter the kingdom of God. You see, for those who are written in the book of life, Jesus Christ died on the cross. They put nails in his hands and a spike through his side and a crown of thorns on his brow. And he suffered one of the most agonizing physical deaths that a person can suffer. But that wasn't his real suffering. The real suffering of Jesus Christ was when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, God took your sins and my sin and laid on Christ. He bore our sins. He went to hell for us. He took the judgment for us. So the cross is a judgment. What do you have to do? Repent of your sins. And you're not sure that you've repented. To surrender totally to Christ. Your heart, your mind, your body, your life. So that Christ is first in your life. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen thousands of people do this past week. 
get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. And you can get up and go back and join your friends. We're going to give you some literature, a book that will help you in your Christian life. But you get up and come. And don't delay, because he says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You may never have another moment like this as long as you live. When will you ever see another thing like this in Pittsburgh? Maybe another generation, or maybe never. And as far as you're concerned, it may never be. We're going to wait for you. You come from way up there, wherever you are, God is speaking to you. And back here, where the seats have filled in, you come and join them. River Stadium in Pittsburgh, where three rivers come together right here. You have heard the message, and God has spoken to you. And we've seen hundreds of people come here. Many more hundreds on the way. You can make your commitment to Christ where you are. You can say yes to Christ. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you and give you a new life. Let him come into your heart right now. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I do repent of my sins as best I know how. I'm not sure that I know how, but Lord, help me to repent. And help me to believe, Lord. I need your help even in the believing. And help me to follow you and serve you. He'll help you. If you make that commitment, call that number on the screen. Now we're going to wait for others that are still coming down the aisles. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 102nd Psalm. The 102nd Psalm, and a very strange verse in a way, the 5th through the 6th and 7th verses. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. This week, President Reagan, in his news conference, declared to the world, you can look pessimistically on the world today, or you can look optimistically. He said, I chose the optimistic look. And tonight, I want to speak on why I am an optimist. And in this passage of Scripture, an interesting little story surrounds it. In 1954, we were in England, and we were holding a crusade that lasted three months at uh, the Haringey Arena in London, England. And my wife is a bookworm, and she loves to go to old bookstores and buy old books and just browse through old books. And she has hundreds of them that she's gotten over the years, some of the great classics. And on this occasion, she saw a little old man in there, well, he wasn't an old man, about a middle-aged man, and he was very discouraged and very despondent looking, and he came up to her and said, are you Mrs. Billy Graham? And she said, yes, I am. He said, well, you know, he said, I'm so discouraged. He said, my marriage is breaking up, and he said, everything is happening to me. I don't know what I'm going to do. And she said, well, why don't you come out to the Haringey Arena tonight and hear the gospel? And she gave him some tickets that she had in her bag, and she didn't see him again. Wondered what had happened to him. Prayed for him. One year later, we were back in that same city of London holding a crusade at Wembley Stadium, where incidentally it poured rain every night in the open air like this, except on the last night, and it was clear and ice cold. So we had a delightful time in the rain and in the cold. But an average of 60,000 people every night came. And on that last day, I remember we had 90,000 people in that cold air. But anyway, she went to that same bookstore. She was browsing around and this same man came and he was bright and chipper and Ruth said, I've never seen such happiness on the face of anybody. And he said, you know, I took the tickets. I went to the arena that night. I accepted Christ as my savior. My wife accepted Christ, said, now we have a Christian family. 
And he said, you know the verse of scripture that your husband quoted that night that won me to the Lord? He said it was a hundred and second Psalm and he got a Bible and he showed her. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Now I never thought of that as being an evangelistic verse. But it was to him because he said that described my condition. Because he said I felt like a pelican in the wilderness. A pelican doesn't belong in the wilderness. He belongs down at Galveston or someplace. I'm like an owl of the desert. Well, owls don't go to the desert much. And he said, that's the way I felt that night. And he said, it changed my life. Now the whole world tonight is like a pelican, an owl or a sparrow. Dickens wrote of the French Revolution in 1775 that it was the best and the worst of times. And that's what we're seeing today. Glamour Damocles in the fourth century BC said something against the king of Syracuse and he was ordered to sit under a naked sword suspended by a single hair. Now there's a difference between an optimist and a pessimist. And I heard about uh, one of our prisons, two convicts were looking out of a cell window one night and the pessimist saw only the bars. But the optimist saw the stars. Yesterday, we read of a 31-year-old son of one of America's most wealthy and influential families, you'd know his name if I called it, who left America for India with this resolve. Here's what he said, quoted in the press. I renounce capitalism. I renounce communism. I come to India to settle here permanently to have the grace of the Supreme God. And with this, he assumed a brand new name. Forgetting his past, becoming a new name, hoping that there somewhere at the feet of a guru, he'll find the answer. One night we were leaving India about three years ago and we went to the New Delhi airport. We had been up in the northeastern part of India preaching up in the mountains. And at the Delhi airport it was jammed with American students. They were lying all over the place, university students. And I said, who are these people? They said there are three 747s coming to pick them up. They've been here studying at the feet of some guru and they're going back disillusioned. Young people searching for something, anything to find peace and happiness in a world that seems to have gone mad and insane. Nothing seems to make sense to some of our young people anymore. And then they read about some of their heroes. Well, I can remember 15 years ago and 20 years ago, people went absolutely wild over Elvis Presley. And now the trial has just finished and we've read all in the press about how terribly he had gotten in his latter days on drugs and how these drugs probably contributed to his early death. And many of the people that are your heroes and many of the people that you think are at the top are really in their hearts at the bottom. Searching. They don't find it in all this popularity. They don't find it in all the adulation. They don't find it in all the popularity. They don't find it in money. They don't find it in some other philosophy. But they can find it in Jesus Christ. And so can you. There's a telephone number there on your screen right now. If you will pick up your phone and call that number, a counselor is standing by to say a word to you. You can find the answer in the person of Jesus Christ. Many of you here tonight have an unfulfilled longing in your soul. A New York taxi driver about, oh, it's been a year ago now, I suppose, asked me if there was anything to cheer about where I came from. And I said, certainly there's many things to cheer about. And I thought about at least four times, Jesus said, be of good cheer. The first time Jesus said it was to a paralytic. He said, son, be of good cheer. Your sins have forgiven you. Now this man was sick of palsy, but Jesus knew that he had deeper needs. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus said a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. There's something deeper in your life that you need that materialism cannot satisfy. Money cannot satisfy. Pleasure cannot satisfy. And one of the things that you need is the forgiveness of sin. 
Because all of us have sinned against God. And the word sin means lawbreaker. You are a breaker of the laws of God, and so am I. And the Bible says that you have, if you have broken in one point, you have broken all of God's laws. So we are breakers of all of God's laws, and there is a penalty for breaking the law of God, and that penalty is death and destruction and judgment in hell. That's the penalty. And we're all under sentence. We're like Damocles sitting under that naked sword. We're already under condemnation. We're not going to be condemned when we die. We're condemned now. We're already under condemnation. And Jesus came to save us from that condemnation and from the penalty of that sin. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth. That shall he also reap. You see, man is trapped by sin. We're in a trap. Very much like a rat that's been captured in a trap. A featured film in Houston this week is The First Deadly Sin. And the first deadly sin was committed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they rebelled against God and broke God's laws and you and I inherited the same tendency to sin. It went to Cain and Abel and Cain killed his brother. He became jealous. He became filled with pride. And he killed his brother. Murder took place right in just outside the Garden of Eden. And it's still taking place all over the world. And then not only that, but we suffer spiritual death and eternal death. And that means that when your body dies, your soul, the spirit that lives in your body, goes out into eternity away from God, lost. And that's why it's so important for you to repent of sin and turn to Christ while you can. We're trapped in sin. We saw today the account of a 54-year-old who beat up his 91-year-old mother to get money. He got $1,200. Then from the torture of his guilt, he committed suicide. The Bible, thank God, assures wonderful forgiveness for all sin. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. God can forgive you because of the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ died for our sins. And because he was willing to die, God can now forgive you and remain just. You see, God had a problem. How could God forgive the sinner and remain just and holy and righteous? Because if God had come along and patted us on the back and said, you're forgiven, he would have been a liar. And if God had been a liar, he would have not been God. Somebody had to pay the penalty. You and I are guilty. Who's going to pay the penalty? Jesus paid it. That's the reason he came. We sing that song, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. That's the reason the word blood is used in Scripture because the word blood stands for life. He gave his life for us on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And it's wonderful to know that all your sins are covered by the blood of Christ. Yes, God can forgive sin because of the cross. And if you'd like forgiveness tonight and to know that you're forgiven, you that are watching by television, pick up that telephone now and call the number on your screen and be sure. You know, the United States Air Force I read recently was trying to locate a major who was lost in flight and it cost $10 million to search for that one man. But God gave far more than that for each of us. The Los Angeles writer, Alice Ramirez, wrote in her syndicated column this week, in this year of the handicapped, she spent a day in a wheelchair as an assumed paraplegic. It gave her a whole new perspective of what it means to be handicapped. You know, one time I went several hours with a blindfold around me just to see what it would be to be blind. It gives you a whole new perspective on what it means to be handicapped. But you see, God in Christ came down and became a man. He became handicapped in a man's body. The mighty God of heaven went into a man's body as it were. And just like us, only without sin, and finally died on the cross. And when he died, he became guilty of our sins. 
He'd never told a lie. He'd never committed adultery. He'd never had lust. He'd never been jealous. And yet he became guilty of all of it because he had your sins on him. And when they put the spikes in his hands and the spear in his side and the blood gushed forth and he suffered and the angels of heaven came, were ready to come to rescue him, he said, no, forgive them. I, they know not what they do. And he's saying tonight, I'll forgive you if you'll come to me in repentance and faith. In 1 Peter, Peter says in the 18th verse of the first chapter, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We were redeemed not with silver and gold, and all the gold in the world can't save your soul. You can give all your money to charity. You can give all your money to the church, but that won't save you. You can work all you the rest of your life in good works, but that won't save you. You can join every church in town, but that won't save you. You must repent of your sins and receive Christ by faith. For by grace are ye saved, through faith in that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can't work your way. It's grace, and the word grace means unmerited favor, something you don't deserve. God gives it to you as a gift, something you can't buy, you can't work for. It's a gift. And God offers you the gift, but you have to reach out and receive it. And the Bible teaches that this world system is dominated by evil. Satanic, cosmic principles of force and greed and selfishness and ambition and pleasure seem to be in control most of the time. And the world system is very powerful. It is often outwardly religious and scientific and cultured and elegant. But underneath is seething with rivalries and ambitions and lust and hate and greed and jealousies. That's the world. And Jesus said, that world will not like you because you're following me. It hated me, it'll hate you. And often this world of evil is upheld in a time of crisis only by armed force. I don't mean everybody in the world is evil. I'm talking about the sins of the world, the evils of the world dominated by the devil. But Jesus met the world with all of its evil. He met the devil. He met the flesh, which means the evil principle within us. And he conquered. He conquered death, which is the last great enemy of mankind. And by the cross, we are crucified to the world. In other words, because Jesus died on the cross, the world system with all of its power has been crucified as far as we're concerned. It has no longer power over us. Sin shall no longer dominate us. Sin no longer reigns over us. We may fail in sin, but the moment we do, we'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit and we get up and confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Christ has disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them triumphing over them, the Bible says. Our authority over the world is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have authority, I have power. So do you, an ordinary believer over the evils of the world. And so let the temptations come. Let the devil try to get you off track. And you have a power there with you. That's the reason we try to get you into the scriptures and get you studying the word of God and memorizing scripture. Because when Jesus met the devil, he didn't argue with the devil. He didn't debate the devil. He quoted scripture. He said, it is written three times and three times the devil was defeated. The tempter is going to come. But you have a power in the Word of God and you have a power in the Holy Spirit living within to help you as you meet the temptations and troubles and trials of this world. Yes, I'm an optimist. I believe that I can overcome the world because of Christ. I'm not afraid of all the sins and the evils and the lusts and the temptations around me. I can walk straight in the midst of this world. It doesn't mean that I get out of the world. I have to live every day in the world and those temptations are there. but I have a power to say no. So do you have a power to say no. The same power that's available to all of us in Jesus Christ. And then lastly, 
the coming again of Christ. He said, be of good cheer, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Yes, Jesus Christ is coming back again. He's going to set up his kingdom and he's going to reign forever and ever and ever. And the kingdom of God is going to triumph. No ideology existing today is going to last. None. Only Christ will last. As King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will come back in flaming fire. Taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to be punished with everlasting destruction. But when he, come, he, when he comes, he shall be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed. In that day, you'll find that little phrase used everywhere. That day, in that day, in that day, the last days or the day. It's used all the way through. That is the day of his return. I go to bed every night with the hope that Christ is coming. No, this world is not going to blow up in some great atomic war. The human race is not going to be totally destroyed. God has other plans. He has a plan that Christ is going to be on the throne. And Christ is going to rule. And evil will be destroyed. The devil will be cast into hell and the demons will be cast into hell. There is going to be universal joy. There is going to be universal peace. There is going to be universal justice. And the scripture says that you and I have to make a choice. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Elijah said, why halt you between two opinions? Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Jesus said, enter in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go therein. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. He said in that seventh chapter of Matthew that there are two gates. He said there are two trees. He likened life to a tree. One produces good fruit and one a bad fruit. You are like a tree. He said there are two foundations. One is built upon the sand and when the wind comes, it blows away and the other is built upon the rock and it lasts. Which is yours? You must choose. You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do? First, you have to repent of your sin. The word repent means that you're willing to change your way of living. You say, oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry. I'm willing to change my way of living. And then by simple childlike faith, like a little child trusts his father or mother, you trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. And then you're willing to follow him and serve him, whatever the cost. If you have a doubt that you know Christ tonight, I'm going to ask you to do something we've seen hundreds and several thousand people already do this week. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, and come down on this field and say tonight, I want to know that I have eternal life. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want Christ to have all of me tonight. And I'm ready to pay whatever price he calls upon. me. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And why do I ask you to come? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. He died on the cross publicly for you. People sneering and laughing at him but he hung there for you. Now he says you come publicly and declare yourself for me. The Bible warns that his spirit will not always strive with us. You may never be this close to the kingdom of God again. This is your one moment. You better take advantage of it. When will we ever see this in Houston again? Never in this generation, most likely. You get up and come and make your declaration for Christ tonight and receive him into your heart and let him come and change your whole way of living. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And after you've come here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends.
Just that simple decision that means everything in eternity. You come, we're going to wait. Quickly, men, women, young people from over here, all around and up in that top stand up there, it takes an extra minute, so start now. Don't let anything keep you from Christ. You come, bring your friend with you. You that are watching by television can see scores of people coming here to make their commitment to Jesus Christ.